I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Wanna bet? What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Eight days ago on the other side of the state, we were briefly given reason to believe that this was a different version of the Maple Leafs. Oops. That is the lead in Chris Johnston's latest for North Star Bets, a scathing column about the Toronto Maple Leafs who are down 3-0 in their opening round series against the Florida Panthers. Uh, It is worth your time to read. Uh, He pulls no punches. And I'll just be frank, and we could get into this. You're basically saying this series is over. Well, I mean, I don't know how much time you have for history, but this series basically is over. And, and I will gladly eat my words of like anyone would in this situation if somehow the Leafs pull off the improbable. But th- they're not the 2014 L.A. Kings who had won a Stanley Cup and who were up against a team with San Jose who they, you know, I think they had some root in the Sharks' minds at that time. They're not, you know, whatever, the 1942 Maple Leafs or the 70 whatever Islanders, you know, with no disrespect to those teams. I mean, this is... This is just a massive opportunity the Leafs have let slip through their hands here. And, you know, the the one thing Sheldon Keefe said on Monday that really stood out to me is, he's like, this is difficult to understand. And it actually is. Like, if you peel back the numbers, it has never happened that Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, uh, William Nylander, and John Tavares have played three consecutive games for the Maple Leafs, and one of them didn't score a goal. Until this series, it had never happened. You actually have to go back to November 2021 to find an instance when it happened in back to back games, let alone three in a row. I mean, the reason the Leafs are losing this series is because they're not scoring enough. And the, the players the program is built around have not produced yet again in a big moment. And, you know, it's just hard to give anyone any benefit of the doubt at this stage of the cycle of the team of those individuals. And I say this with huge respect, you know, I'm sitting here in in the Panthers arena. They've obviously gone on a great heater to get into the playoffs to begin with, to knock off the Boston Bruins. I mean, they're, they're full value. They've, they've gotten their game together at the right time of the year to have this kind of run. But look, whenever the Leafs are going to have a playoff run of their own, you're going to come up against great teams. I mean, that that's, That's just the reality. You have to find your way through great teams. And they have just punted away an opportunity here in the second round. And I, and look, I get it. We got to cover these next games. Maybe they win game four, you know, I'm going home anyway, maybe Friday night, I'm going to have something to do. And I have to go down to Scotiabank arena for game five. Maybe they win game five and Saturday morning, you know, I'm flying right back down here, but it's just hard to imagine them winning four straight games. And I recognize what you're doing here by asking the question, Julian, there is, there is a chance, of course, however small it is, that I will look foolish or that, that column that I filed last night or, or even this, this pod and probably Thursday's pod won't age well. But, I mean, at a certain point, you're going based on what you have seen over years and years and years. And, you know, there's just no benefit of the doubt to be granted here. Um, and I, and I, I don't see how the Leafs get out of this, honestly. And, and I think that this should be, along with some other, I mean, this will be this will be one of those ones. Whenever those players are in their retirement days, I think are going to have to think a little twice about just just the fact that they weren't able to make this more of a series that they had leads in games two and three and didn't find a way to get the job done. Um, that that you know their abilities are you know abandon them on the biggest moment. And, and I know that this is only round two, but we know what the stakes are for this team, and and that's. That's why I started the column in the way I did. Eight days ago, it did feel different, right? They, they'd managed to win three games in Tampa in round one against a three-time Stanley Cup finalist. They'd won all three games in, in that series in overtime. They've really looked like they weren't, they were never shooting themselves in the foot in that series. I mean, say what you will. Um, they had the play taken to them for stretches, of course, but they, they were playing smart and safe and they were letting their, those talented guys uh, who all earned praise you know, breakthrough in that, that round. I mean, they all had big, big offensive outputs, big moments, scored some big goals and they get to round two and it's nowhere to be found. And 
I suspect we're going to be talking about the Leafs breakdown day before you know it. My favorite part of the article, you kind of allude to that fact when you discuss uh, the fact that they seemed like a team that had found a way to finally get over that first round hump and then get to the second round. There's a line in the article where after they go through all these first few games and they're just left with the same thousand yard stairs and empty cliches, what more was there to be said? How do you find perspective when you're trapped in a hall of mirrors? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing for the players to have to say the same things over and over about oh, why didn't they get the job done? Why are they in this position again? Like, what, as someone who has been around the team as close as you have, like, I, I sense, like, it, like, you're obviously not a fan of the team, but there's, like, a frustration in hearing some of those same quotes and tropes over and over again from you and the rest of the press corps, too. Well, it's not, it's not the frustration you might think it is, though. It's it's more, you know, we've been looking at this problem and describing it and writing about it, in my case, talking about it for years, and the frustration comes from the fact that it just brings you back to the same place. Like, you don't have a new, you don't have a new reason to, to explain why this year is different from last year, is different from 2021 and 2020 and 2019. I mean, ultimately, I think you have to conclude at a certain point that they just don't have the right mix. Um, and, and that is not an attack on these players. I, I have no doubt if, if any of them end up being shipped to a new team next year, we, we will be writing stories and talking about how, you know, player X, I'm not even going to say who it is because I don't know what's going to happen. But player X, look how he's fit in and the Leafs were crazy to let him go. I mean, this is, this is what happens, right? I mean, who's been great for the Panthers in the series? Matthew Kachuk, Sam Bennett. Sam Reinhardt scores an overtime winner. Those are all high draft picks from other organizations, you know, that had to find their way to Florida, um, you know, through a variety of different circumstances for each of them. And, and they're now thriving here. I mean, this is what happens in pro sports. I just think we're, we're, we're reaching the end with this experiment that the Leafs have, have basically banked an era on um, with these players at the center of it. Right. I mean, the whole point, and, and let's not relitigate everything. Cause I think everyone is probably at the same point point here but i mean i think we have to underline it the entire point of of paying four top forwards what the leafs are paying them is the idea you get into a playoff series and of course one or more of them will get shut down at a given moment or go cold or, or be maybe battling an injury or what have you but the idea is that you have enough to get through that that either you're, you're going to be able to be an overwhelming matchup um one way or another for the opponent or or those players collectively are going to pull you through i mean that's Look at Colorado's run, right? Nachushkin scored huge goals. McKinnon was like on fire early in the series. Nazem Kadri comes back and scores in overtime in the Stanley Cup final after having a broken hand. You know, Makar put up big numbers. You know, we've seen it with Point and Kucherov, Stamkos, Hedman. Uh, you, you throw Vasilevsky into Tampa's mix. You know, with, with those Pittsburgh Cups, you had the three lines the one year, right? It was Crosby and Melkin on separate lines, but also Phil Kessel leading a third line and, and that was productive for Pittsburgh. I mean, you don't win with one star player. Uh, or, or one individual pulling you through. You, you need a, a team. And the, the guys the Leafs are built around have not collectively been able to do that. Uh, again, it's not to say they've been awful in every game or anything like that. You know, I think Austin Matthews in particular, he's only gone one game in these playoffs where he was held without a point. It happened to be game three uh, last night's game here in Florida. But, um, you know, he's, and he's had some big moments. I think Mitch Marner has struggled. You know, for me, Marner is a guy that, that really hasn't got it going. You know, he's now played seven games in a row without a, a goal. He's got one assist in the last four. You know, John Tavares hasn't had a point since scoring the overtime winner against Tampa. Nylander's actually had it cooking a little bit the last two games. He made a play on, on one of the goals in game three. You know, we saw him in game two go nuts in the third period. I mean, he's had some moments, but add it all together, it's not been near enough. And it's not been near enough for this team. And, and I think... As much as you do get some good stories in the playoffs and, and unlikely heroes might step up on a given night, I mean, the Leafs aren't built in a way that, you know, their, their bottom six is carrying them to multiple victories in a series or that Ilya Samsonov, who's now out injured, is going to steal you three games. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not the way they're constructed. They're constructed where these guys make the difference. And as a group together, they haven't been able to make the difference in Toronto. As I say, I, I do think we're at, we're at the point major change is the only option. I don't know what it's going to be, but there's no justification. There's no, you can twist yourself in a pretzel trying to talk yourself into why you might do something. I mean, you're, you, they're at the end here. And I think that there is some finality to this. You know, I saw Steve Dangle say that in his LFR video, actually, like, like one of the things is with them losing in this manner, you, 
you, you, you, it's not voodoo anymore, right? It's not like, oh, the hockey gods conspired against them. I mean, in a second round playoff series, they had home ice advantage. They're playing a team that finished 19 points behind them in the regular season. You've seen the heavyweights knocked out. You knocked one of them out yourself. Tampa's gone. Boston's already gone home. Colorado's gone home on the other side of the bracket. I mean, we've talked about what a wide open path there is for someone to get hot, to seize the moment, to elevate their game, to go and grab this thing. And in that moment, the Toronto Maple Leafs weren't good enough to get the job done. And it's the same group of players that have been through multiple series. And I just don't see any way that we're not talking about significant change this off season for this team. That might be removing one of those players. You know, we still have to see what's going to happen with Kyle Dubas, the general manager, Sheldon Keefe, the head coach, maybe even president Brendan Shanahan. I mean, I, I don't know how deep this goes, but I, I do think you get to this moment and they just aren't good enough. And, and it, it's really quite simple, right? Because you, that the whole bet here, you know, one thing I've heard Kyle Dubas say repeatedly is that he just feels like you give this group enough opportunities, eventually it's going to fall into place. I don't even know that that was an unreasonable thing for him to believe, quite honestly. I mean, and, and so my point is I'm not coming at him with hindsight, but, but I, what I am going to say is you, you see enough of the story and it's the same thing and it's especially game three. I mean, it's, it's basically a no-show by that group of players. Again, it's not like every moment in the game was bad. Matthew sits a post. Like, there are ways it could have been better. But it was not enough. They were not overwhelming enough. They didn't take over the game. And, it, and it, you know, and you look at the other series too, right, Julian? Like you've got Jack Hughes, a young player. He comes out and he's got a goal and an assist in the first five minutes. You know, they, they went back to New Jersey. They needed a response on home ice against Carolina. Who drove that response? The best players in the Devils. Who's getting the job done for the Oilers? And I know that their, their power play is just otherworldly, and that's where some of that production's coming from. You know, the Leafs have just played a game where they didn't have a power play opportunity in game three at all. But still, Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid are just filling the score sheet. Uh, I'm not saying that, that any or all of the Leafs should have 13 goals through two rounds, uh, as Dreisaitl does. I mean, the, I recognize sometimes there's something even special beyond greatness. But, you know, the Leafs guys aren't getting it done. And so I don't know what's going to happen in these next couple of games. But to me, anything less than them somehow be writing their own history story here we're still looking at change for the organization and, and rather significant change because, um, you know, I know that they've, they've turned over the bottom of the roster a lot in Toronto, but they've never touched kind of these, these central figures, at least until now. Let's table some of that conversation for the day. If it happens where the Leafs are eliminated, because they are still alive and there are some people who still believe they could somehow be the fifth team in NHL history to come back from a three Oh deficit and again, to, I didn't bring up the article for for for, con, for a little thing here. I didn't bring it up just to make you look like an idiot for anything like that for future clips or all that. I just it was a very direct article, and and I'm with you too. I think the Leafs are probably going to lose this series with the way that it's looking. Well, but it I, just, I'm not, yeah, I'm not making a prediction. Either no, way. I'm not saying that. I, I'm writing in the moment. Like you cannot have a bigger game for an entire like the whole organization is on trial in that game three. Right. And the Leafs right. have, they have what? I, I mean, Paul Marie said it was five two on ones in the first seven minutes. They, they had a couple of two on ones in the first few minutes. They still come out of the first period with four shots on net. Four shots in a game that matters this much. And okay, look, I get it. Details are important. No one wants to make a mistake. They have a lead no. in the game. They have a lead in the game, though, at least. They give up that lead. Do you know what? They go back and get it. Then they give it up again. And, and look, and it's a bad bounce. Um, it goes off of Verhage's butt. But still, I just feel like <laughs> you just can't lose. You, you, you have to find a way to win those games. Like I, I know that that's not a deep level of analysis, but sometimes you get to this stage of the season, we can be that reductive, right? It, it can be that simple. Like your star players have to find you a way to win a game with their season on the line, with really their era to some degree on the line. I mean, I, I'm not predicting they're all gone and everything changes next year, but no. I, there, will, there will be some level of change, of course, Unless they pull off, unless they pull off the miracle, unless somehow we're talking before a game seven, that's the only time I'm willing to even back off slightly on this stance is if they can get it to a game seven, um, which feels like a long way off. But look, other teams have done it. You win one, you win one, you win one, you try to win one more. But um, obviously, the Leafs aren't winning anything unless some of those players put the puck in the net. It's, you know, it's not on Sam Lafferty and Eric Gustafson and Noel Achari and David Camp to, to score the biggest goals of this playoff run. You know, it's got to be Matthews, Marner, Tavares, or Nylander. 
I forgot the question I was going to ask, so I'm just going to jump to this. What's it like from your vantage point seeing a fan base that a little over a week ago was as high as they've been in almost 20 years over a series win compared to the present day where dread has firmly set in? And it seems like all the goodwill from that first round series is gone. Well, it is gone. It should be gone. Right? I mean, look at I get being a fan is to be emotional. So you, you ride the ups and the downs with your team. But the Leaf fans have been through this so much that this is a familiar state for them. Like, like I'm sure Steve Dangle and Adam Wilde and all our buddies at the SDPN that root on the Leafs quite openly. I'm sure they woke up on Monday morning and they're like, ah, oh, this is that familiar feeling again. Uh, you know, the, the feeling they maybe weren't used to is the one – from eight or nine days before where they, you know, had some hope and all of a sudden it feels like things are breaking your way. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that's what it is. You know, I'm sitting here in Florida. Do you know what I'm thought of? The Panthers won the president's trophy last year, beat Washington at the first round. Then they got swept in like a five or six day series, not just because they had back-to-back games in that series against Tampa. Their season was over. And someone was probably sitting at this very press conference table that I'm sitting at right now, trying to explain how that happened and what it meant. And it must have felt pretty damn hollow. Like the president's trophy didn't mean too much when they were done after four games in round two. I think that's where the Leafs would be at if they're swept or even if they lose in five. I mean, look, there's some, there's definitely some pride in not getting swept. I think you have to, if you're on the Toronto side of the ledger here and none of the fans are going to want to hear it, even people with the, the microphones might not want to hear it, but you know, they have to try to not have this be a sweep. They have to focus on getting it back to home and hope that something changes and hope that, that the pressure shifts to Florida. I mean, like that's, that's all you can have when you're facing these circumstances. Um, but if they, if they just lose now, you're right. Like it, it does take some of the shine off a first round win. That was a hard fought series. and was a long time coming. It was a great moment. We gave them the flowers for it. It really was. It was a cool thing to see. And, and I know that, that a lot of fans out there had suffered for a while, but do you know what else Florida did last year? Florida fired the head coach, traded away some star players, made a bold decision with Matthew Kachuk, signed him to a big deal. And look, it almost didn't work, right? When we were talking about the Panthers in mid-March, it didn't necessarily look like they were going to even be in the playoffs. But, you know, that was a team that had a tremendous amount of success last year, but ultimately had a hollow end of their season. And part of it was driven by the fact, you know, they were either going to have to extend Huberto that summer. Like, they had decisions to make on those players. Well, look, the, the Leafs are in the same circumstances right now. Uh, they, they have to make decisions. Well, I mean, really, I don't think there's a decision. It's They have to figure out if Austin Matthews wants to come back, what that contract looks like. They have to make a decision on William Melander, who can also sign a deal by July 1st. They have to make a decision on Kyle Dubas. Um, you know, but I, I just don't see how, again, assuming this goes as it looks like it's going, the Leafs aren't in the same position as the Panthers last year, where it just feels like, okay, we did a lot of good things this year, but we're a long way from the Stanley Cup. Right. I mean, as we're recording this, there's still 12 wins from the Stanley Cup. Uh, yeah. you're, it's like so close and yet so far away. There's only eight teams less playing, uh, but that's a lot of games that they have to somehow try to win. And, and the Leafs just look, they played nine games in the playoffs They're four and five. They've won one of nine games in regulation. You have to go back two years to find the last time they played nine games with only one in regulation. I mean, at the worst, absolute worst time, they have not played their best hockey and they don't deserve to be any further ahead. I mean, you, you can maybe say they could have won game two, of course, like, like we could do that with all sorts of teams, but you are where you are for a reason. And I, I just think that they haven't played well enough to, des- to deserve a lead in this series. And, and really in some ways you might say with the benefit of Heinz that they're fortunate to get through the first round. And so if this just ends here in game four or game five, even game six, I think real tough questions need to be asked. And I think a new path has to be charted forward. Man, I, I, it's so it for me, someone again, an outsider to all of this, just waking up and seeing trade proposals for guys in the core four and just discussing Kyle Dubas's future or Sheldon Keefe's future. Like, I understand, like, Leafs fans have endured way too much with this core, and I get why people are already looking to throw those names out there. For trades and, and already pitching the putting the tent down that was pitched up at the beginning of the postseason. It's just like it's not over till it's over. And like I'm hesitating to get into any and I'm not saying you are, but I'm hesitating to get into any of that type of stuff. I'm very close to it. Went, I'm very close uh, yeah. to it. You're, you're you're saving me from the ditch right now, but I'm very Yeah, because because like what if they win Wednesday? What if they win game six? 
what if what if Brian O'Reilly is proven right? Brian O'Reilly, Ryan O'Reilly's dad. There's a tweet going around. There is a just a great feeling cheering for the Leafs that they will come back from a three-game deficit and win the series. It just feels good to cheer for a team that can do the impossible. Like like what like what if that happens? What if that opportunity does present itself for the Leafs? We would talk about one of the most remarkable turnarounds in, in NHL playoff history, a team that was the butt of the joke for how many, I mean, two, you could still argue they might still be, and it would be worse for them off if they, if they get swept by the Panthers. But if they go through all that, but they somehow turn it around, like, like it's still, a, it, there's still a chance, but I also get history is, is played out too. And people are just fed up, man. Like this is there. Well, you have every reason not to believe in this core. There's a chance, but then they have to play well enough to win the game. They haven't taken control, right? They haven't exuded their no. will. I mean, they did – look, they did to start game two. It was like 13-3 to three in shots at one point. It was 2 nothing in that game. They're on home ice. It looks like they're going to even the series, and yet they, they commit these mistakes. I mean, really, they were self-inflicted errors that allowed Florida not only to tie that game but to go ahead 3-2 early in the second period. I mean, for sure, there have been stretches in the series where they, they have exuded their will, exerted their will, and, and been the better team, but it has not been near enough to win a game, in my estimation. So – Okay, go show it to us. That would be the way. If you wanted to write something nicer or say something a little bit more palatable on forms like this one, mix in a few victories and, and we'll be giving you flowers again. I mean, that's that's kind of how it works. I mean, do you see LeBron James quote this week? He was talking about in the playoffs how he's just got to avoid all talk because he's like, you win a game and you're the greatest ever and you lose a game and everyone's tearing you down. I mean, that that there is a lot of truth in that because that's how that's – I mean, we're, we're trying to – we're trying to – judge legacies in real time right i mean we're not judging lebron's legacy at this point in time but i mean no. for a group of for a group of players that have done a lot for the leafs but haven't done a lot in the playoffs we're judging their legacies in real time and in an 03 hole against the bottom seed in their conference again a, seed, a good team florida like i'm not none of this is really designed to to take a run at the panthers but you have to beat a good team in the playoffs like that's that's how it works and here we go. Let's see what happens anything, on Wednesday. Anything else you want to dissect from Panthers Leafs before we do a quick you can bet that segment? No, Paul Maurice sat at this table an hour ago where I'm sitting now, and he said, play your asses off, see what happens. That's where we're at. Go believe it on the that, line, and, and we'll see who wins. I guess that's as, as best as we can take it when it comes to this series. Uh, selfishly, I... Hope for your sake you get to go home and not travel as much because you, you're 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 exhausted. I'm no, I'm. I look at if they want to stretch this out to seven, I you I will never make a complaint. Getting to cover the Stanley Cup playoffs is a dream, but but you know I just don't see it right now. You, you're, we're going to have to see something from the Leafs in Game Four that they haven't shown us probably really yet in the playoffs because it gets harder and harder the longer you go, and they're they're shrinking and shrinking. All right. Well, we're going to get to David Bastel for you can bet that real quick. We'll touch off on some of the other games and moments that have happened uh, over the last few days, and then we will get to a few questions. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Welcome to You Can Bet That with David Bastel. DB, always a pleasure to see you. Good to see you, gentlemen. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. Now, by the time this episode drops, uh, it may come just in time for the NHL Draft Lottery, which is tonight. Uh, who is the betting favorite? Uh, well, I mean, we already have the odds that are out there, of course. Yep. But uh, how does Sports Interaction see it? You know what? They kind of zero it in on the same way the NHL has their odds as well. The Anaheim Ducks, of course, are the favorites to win the draft lottery. They're paying about a four to one at Sports Interaction right now. Uh, so you know what? But as you guys know, it's not always um, it's not always a team that has the best odds as far as drawing that magic ball cj it's we've seen a lot of different upsets one of my favorite upsets was when the the year the jets moved up to the number two position to draft patrick line that was definitely uh lottery luck i know a lot of montreal canadians fans are hoping that lottery luck hits them tonight uh they're around seven and a half to one uh to to move up into that number one spot but uh it's all about the lottery balls and uh which one will drop first I bet there's a bunch of people in Vancouver hoping they defy the odds, too. Uh, I don't know the odds aren't particularly on their side, but obviously Bedard growing up a Canucks fan and 
that organization badly needing a, a reboot. I mean, look, there's a lot of teams. I mean, who doesn't want this guy? I mean, Anaheim, San Jose, these teams have not won a draft lottery in years. And so they're hoping this is the year because it looks like the prospect uh, that you really want to get that pick for. Yeah, it's also it's crazy to think, guys, too, like a team like the Washington Capitals are in this lottery and for 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 Capitals to get this kind of boost, considering that, you know what, a lot of what we've seen in Capitals past are still kind of around. And to get this kind of lift at this time, it's like, you know, anything can happen and we will see tonight. Do you know my prediction? Fire. Give us your prediction, please. He's going to Columbus. Oh, Mm. Oh, just a just a feeling, just yeah. a feeling. I I bought a uh, I bought a uh, seven and a half to one on the Montreal Canadiens. Just okay. as, uh, and it, and same sort of thing, CJ. Just a feeling. You know, it's definitely not the odds on favorite. I think they're actually only the fifth best odds. So there's uh, there's a handful of teams ahead of them, but a bunch of teams behind them as well. What about you, Julian? Uh, what uh, what are you hoping for? So, or thinking like- or predicting or. I would like to see him go to the Anaheim Ducks just with all those cool young players they have over there. That being said, I see Arizona stacked where they're at, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, Hmm. but I imagine the people who are conspiracy theorists (laughs) see the number for Arizona, 9.03 according to uh, Sports Interaction, the six best odds, Uh, and they might jump all over that and think, oh, well, Gary Bettman... In, is insisting upon hockey working in Arizona, despite the fact that it's actually a pretty big marketplace. Why not put Connor Bedard there and double down on that? But again, I am not a conspiracy theorist. No. I'm just noticing a very interesting quirk and number. <laughs> I just want uh, that clear. Should be interesting. This is uh, this is a pretty big deal, as you guys know. Oh, for sure. We definitely know that. DB, thank you. Don't forget to check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds. Before game, in-game, best props, sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. There is nothing in all of sports quite like playoff hockey, especially in the first round. So many close games, so many upsets, so many big moments. It is truly great television. And it helps that we have a few Canadian teams in the mix. Uh, well. Toronto and Florida, I mean, I I get it. It's not looking too good for Leafs fans right now. Hey, maybe something will happen. Uh, Edmonton and Vegas, that has looked like a really good series so far. And, of course, we here at the SDPN have you covered on all there is to know when it comes to NHL playoff action. Steve, Adam, and Jesse on the Steve Dangle podcast in fine playoff form. Uh, Myself and CJ on the CJ show, which you happen to be watching right now. So thank you. Uh, We're bringing you all that good can't-miss insider info, and make sure to check out both the SDP and the CJ Show on your favorite podcast app, whether it's Apple, whether it's Spotify, anywhere else. We're there. Watch full episodes anytime on the SDPN YouTube channel, and uh, enjoy uh, having us on your TV screen or on your phone, in your ears. It doesn't really matter, man. Enjoy us as you enjoy the 2023 Stanley Cup playoffs. Let's spend a bit of time on some of the other playoff series if we can. We don't have to spend that long. I know we got to get to questions as well. Uh, But we got to talk about the Edmonton Oilers and the fact that uh, they have tied their series with Vegas. Uh, Leon Dreisaitl has, we've talked about different points of the postseason, but in terms of him as a playoff performer, these last two games showing out for the Oilers, including that four goal output in game one, like dude is really killing it. I'd love to know your thoughts just to start off with the Oilers and the Golden Knights. Yeah, we're, we're going to need a new record book if this continues up because Leon Dreisaitl has no regard for what you're supposed to be doing at this time of year with the amount of goals he scored in particular. And, you know, what stands out to me is this is the second straight spring we're talking about it, right? Uh, where, where Edmonton's top players have really pulled them through, have, have kind of put up some video game numbers and, and, you know, maybe patched over some other inadequacies or weaknesses the team has. And, and really, basically, they're leaning into their strength. I mean, there's there's no way Vegas can can score at the level that, that the Oilers can if this continues. And so, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I don't think a series is really defined or taken shape until you get to game three. I mean, it, it's a switch of venue. It's a switch of which coach controls the matchups within the game and in the series. Uh, I think it, it tends to be a pivotal game in terms of directing which way things are going. And so, you know, it, it was a, the response the Oilers needed in game two. You know, the other thing I liked about Drysaddle, he had four goals in that opener, right? 
But if you saw his post game comments, I mean, he, he was pretty hard on his team in a good way. I think just, just saying that's not the way they play, that it's going to be different and then goes out and, and leads them. I mean, this is, this is what we're talking about. Uh, not to make anything, everything about the Leafs again, but this is sort of when you're leaning on your top guys, this is, this is the difference between winning and losing. And, you know, McDavid and Dreisaitl have, have really helped Edmonton along. And, and I think it's going to be still a heck of a series with, with, with Vegas. I mean, the, the games don't carry over. So, you know, we're recording this before game three. I'm guessing that's going to look different than game two did. Uh, but having 29 on the Oilers side is uh, clearly a benefit to them. Man, just thinking about last year, and you can go through so many other years when you compare both of the cores in Edmonton and Toronto. But before last year with the Edmonton Oilers, we were wondering about their playoff success and how much of that uh, they were going to have with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. But it is amazing to see how one playoff run has made such a significant difference. Them getting out of the first round, them beating the Calgary Flames the second round. They even were, were, were victimized of a sweep, at, but at the hands of the eventual cup champion, Colorado Avalanche, who are not in their purview this time around. But to see that experience kind of work out for the Oilers and to hear a guy like Leon Dreisaitl say that's not the way they're able to that, – that's not the way they're supposed to play – like that speaks from a from experience that speaks from, you know, having gone through some of those battles, at least from last year and seeing success and knowing what they're capable of. Like, it's really, really interesting to see. Well, it's a player's time of year, right? The players decide these games as much as we focus on the matchups and different changes to the lineup. Maybe the coaches are are doing to try to, you know, eke a little bit more out of their team at a time when everybody is giving it everything they have. Um, you know, it's the players that, that dictate what happens in the game. And, and, you know, I think the Oilers have earned the right to believe not only because of their playoff run last year, that certainly helps that's experience. That's, that's proof they can do it. But, you know, as we've talked about, they, they were the best team in the second half in the NHL and they have been a dominant outfit, you know, over several months now, much longer than the period of time where maybe they were kind of a little bit middling out of the gate up and down, you know, strong first 10 games week, week or second 10 game segment. I mean, they, 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 they were much more up and down early on, but they've, they've been clicking at a high level now, I think, for a long enough period of time that they've earned the right to believe that, that they should be Stanley Cup favorites. Uh, and not just in the, maybe in the betting odds, uh, but, but just kind of in the way that they're viewed around the league. I think they have that reputation. I think that, you know, Seattle and Dallas have their own things to worry about, but whoever comes out of that series isn't going to be excited by the potential of, of playing Edmonton. I think they're going to view that as a really tough, tough call and should the Oilers make it all the way to the Stanley cup final, whether they're playing Florida or New Jersey or Carolina or Toronto. Well, it's not going to be, Hey, this is going to be a soft touch. And so, yeah, these, the, the, the players, I mean, I think there's, there's a case dry is the second best player on earth right now. Right. And he's playing beside the first or at least within the same dressing room, depending on the night. So, um, you know, they, they have, They've got big weapons there, and when those guys are performing, I just think it's a really difficult matchup task. It's, it's it's a lot to ask. You know, Vegas is a pretty good team at not giving up generally too much at five on five. They're, you know, pretty strong, uh, organized unit the way they play. But I mean, the, the Oilers can exploit that, and certainly when they get on the power play, look out. I was on another podcast, and I said my top three in the world is McDavid, McKinnon, and Drysidel. I'm inclined to think that's act. I'm I th- I'm willing to put that up against anyone else's top three, and it might be everyone else's top three at this point. It, it might be. I mean, we get swayed by the playoffs, right? Um, but that's what know, we're I, supposed. That's what's supposed to matter. Of course, but I mean, like Matthew Kachuk maybe isn't top three, but he's not far off. I think Jack Hughes probably not top three just yet, but won't be surprised when he gets there because I think you're seeing him climb. Um, you know, it's not, not a good time to be raising the Leafs players names probably given where their series is at, but you know, at times Austin Matthews has definitely been there and certainly was last season. Um, you know, I guess it's a revolving door. I mean, right now, uh, no one's knocking McDavid out of number one, but I think everybody else that's in the two to eight range, just to call it two to 10 range, like you can cycle through the top three based on a, a, a current run of hot play. And certainly that's where Leon Dreisaitl has been at in these playoffs. Uh, last thing I want to mention about that series, we cannot forget about Vegas, and I get that they got walled the way that they did in Game 2, but I still think this goes 7. This is still a really good Vegas team. They found a way to figure out Edmonton in Game 1. Uh, as long as they stay out the penalty box in Game uh, 3, they give themselves a chance. I am i don't want to make it seem like we're we're, we're dusting off uh, the Vegas Golden Knights in any shape or form. No, we're just shining dry sidle here, which is a pretty easy thing to do when you look at the scoring charts. 
Um, but yeah, you're right. And, and look, the Golden Knights actually are pretty, if you look across the year, don't take a lot of penalties as part of their DNA. And so I, it, it didn't go their way in game two, but I, I don't know that that's a trend as much as it might be an outlier uh, for that series. And so, yeah, this, this, this is not over yet. If we've learned anything from these playoffs, I mean, a lot of kind of upsets and unexpected twists and turns. Uh, I think they have a lot still in store for us in this Vegas Edmonton uh, best of seven. And, and we should mention Jack Hughes too, as we go to New Jersey and Carolina really quickly, but like great performance from him. And the fact that uh, this is a team, the first two games of the postseason, you could say that guys like Jack Hughes kind of looked a little bit wide eyed at the prospect of being in the playoffs for the first time with the core that they have. Then they turn it around, make some adjustments and beat a team that didn't do that in the New York Rangers, and they win their first-round series. And now they play a really good Carolina Hurricanes team. First two games, Carolina beating them out the water. But third game, Jack Hughes and the Devils, from the word go, just take over. And Freddie Anderson looked very, very shaky in that third game. But Jack Hughes, man, still outstanding performance by him and the rest of those guys. That has to be noticed. Well, and that's what growth looks like for them. I mean, it's, it's not going away quietly, right? It's not being discouraged by the times when their game hasn't been there for them. They found a way through. They found a way back to win the Rangers series. No predictions at this point. I don't know if they're going to come back on Carolina, but they certainly delivered a pretty strong counterpunch in game three. Uh, went back to Vitek, Ch- Vanacek, and Net too. Um, so they, they've used two goaltenders. I mean, we see Carolina using two, well, three goaltenders because Kochetkov got into to, to game number three in that series with, with anti rant out ill. Uh, so, you know, it, it's... Uh, it's quite a thing. I mean, the Devils, I've been pretty high on. I think I did pick them in this round, so we'll see if they can come back. But, but I mean, Jack Hughes is a, is a difference maker, and he's given his team some big moments here in the playoffs. And uh, Seattle and Dallas as well, they have to get shout out too because the Kraken once again scoring first. They, this time they score early and often, and I am scared to sleep on the Kraken for the rest of the playoffs. I know it looks like if you just go based on vibes and momentum, it's almost like a Seattle, Florida finals in our, in, in our crosshairs here. Right. I mean, Florida won six games in a row over Boston and Toronto. Hard to argue with that um, to get to where they're going and Seattle just, just keep finding a way too. So, um, I mean, if that happens, who would ever call that? I mean, this is, this is why we watch the playoffs. So man, it's, it's for, it's for performances like this from the Kraken because they've been full value to get to where they are. Same with the Panthers. Those, they've outplayed really good teams and found a way to win games. And so this is a, this is a pretty compelling tournament we got on our hands. Florida, Seattle, though, like, am I the only one who feels like even though they've both done their thing in the postseason, it's still not like the sexiest matchup to watch? Oh, probably not. No, but no. I mean, they're not going to care about that. They're, they're trying to win the Stanley Cup. I mean, how do things get sexier? have a team that wins a Stanley cup, then, then your organization gets a little shine and gets, you know, more attention and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that would not be sexy. It would be a difficult travel series. Mm. Uh, that's, that's, that's where my brain goes. Logistics CJ is just like, boop. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at that's like, how your brain goes like a, like a I, robot. Boop, boop, boop. Well, I'm just calculating. Boop, it's boop, like, boop. I don't know. Is, is there like a lot of direct flights? If they are, they're long. Anyway, I mean, when did this turn to an episode of the Jetsons? That's my era, bud. I love it. I was about to say, yeah, I, pur- I purposely picked out that show because I knew you'd be up on the Jetsons. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Let's get to some questions from Ask CJ uh, for the Ask CJ segment. Uh, we've got a few on Discord here. Uh, let's start from uh, Worldwide Daniel. Uh, who are your no longer way too early Stanley Cup finals picks halfway through round two. Oh man. I mean, I'm going to stick with Edmonton just because that's what I had at the outset. I feel like it'd be shameful to bail on them now. Um, the Panthers look dangerous though, man. Like there's something to be said for the team that gets hot and just finds itself is playing free and easy. They've got a pretty good health situation. Knock wood, you know, giving me some like 2012 LA Kings vibes, a team that snuck in, um, but but just really damn hard to play against lots of gamers. So the Panthers are now my dark horse pick. I don't even know if I can say that. I mean, they're, they're the closest as we're recording this actually to the Stanley Cup with three wins through round two. But I'm going to stick with with Edmonton uh, as my as my cup pick. I think the Oilers are going to get the job done. 
I think now we are going to get a 2006 Cup Final rematch. We're going to get the Oilers Ooh. and the Hurricanes. Ooh. Like, 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 the Oilers look as dominant as we've seen them with the players that they have. The Panthers look really great, too. And I get that they lost yesterday, but everyone has been sleeping on the Carolina Hurricanes from the word go for the playoffs. And they, I, I mean, the goaltending is very shaky. But if they find a way to bypass that, they could beat anybody, including the Edmonton Oilers. I'm not saying they will. I'm saying they have the pieces in place to beat teams like the Edmonton Oilers. I don't know if we're sleeping on Carolina as much as we just saw Svechnikov injured for the year and then the Pacioretty thing. And you, you, and they didn't really – they didn't make any big splashes at the deadline. And so I just had my doubts. But you know what we would have if we had that series? We would have Jesse Pugliarvi back against his former team. <laughs> Which you know, I know he's not a he's, he's not a front, he's not a front front line hurricane, but that would that would actually be a, an interesting kind of you know, given that player and and just how he was like ground zero for a lot of different arguments online, uh, that'd, that'd be a nice little twist, wouldn't it? Oh, that would be so good. That first press conference he gets to do at Edmonton, man, and Mark Spector trying to ask him those questions. That's going to go real well. Real well. I don't know what their relationship is like. I'm sure it'll go fine. Um, M.W. Bauer. Uh, try to hold back your laughter for this question, please. <laughs> if the Leafs win in the second round, will you and CJ do another bet? I mean, I would do a bet with you whether the Leafs win or not. I mean, that's fair. Um, yeah. I don't think the Leafs have to be a qualifier for this. So, but the answer funny. is the answer is yes. If the Leafs win, we'll do a bet. But if the Leafs lose to Florida, we'll also do a bet. We'll just have to figure out which conference and what the stakes are. But we got we got probably what like a week to ten days to, to sort of nail that down. I think we can do it. I think so. Uh, hopefully, everyone enjoyed uh, the last episode where I I suffered and ate a putin hot dog, which I do not find all that great. Sorry, people. Uh, that being said, the putin place was good. Um, last one from Congo Red. Uh, this is going to be very interesting. How do insiders hear about front office rumors? The New York Rangers were reported to have interest in Joel Quenville, which was later refuted. And then Elliot Friedman said that the Flames were interested in uh, Stan Bowman. I believe he also mentioned the Pittsburgh Penguins as well. How would those stories get out? Uh, I mean, people yeah, talk, I, mean, I think. No, yeah. I mean, like, it, it's, but it's, I don't mean to try to like shroud it in unnecessary mystery uh i didn't report either of those stories so I, i'm not speaking for the people that did but in general how those stories get out is is you either have a contact well it's it can be a, all of the above um you have a contact in the organization maybe somebody's represented by an agent maybe you maybe that individual him or herself has told you i mean there's all kinds of different ways things get out uh i i would say this more often than not, it's it's less obvious than it would look like, though. Like, like I'm just going to guess, but I don't know. It's probably not Stan Bowman telling Elliot that. Uh, now, it might be. I, I don't know. I really don't know. Obviously, Elliot and I are friends, but, it, you know, you, it's one of those things, even among respected colleagues and friends, you don't talk about that kind of thing. But, um, you know, especially when you get to a stage which we're going to get to, whether it's the Pittsburgh situation, Calgary, some of the coaching vacancies. Like once, once interviews started, candidates fly to cities, people see things, people learn things, usually the names get out. Um, as much as teams try to do things in secret or in confidence, it's not always possible when you're involving a lot of different people knowing about that information. Yeah. Also, that reminds me of the fact that we sort of mentioned Joe Quenville's name last episode, and I said that's something that has to get tabled for another time. I mean, as of now, he hasn't even been reinstated, and it's the same case for Stan Bowman as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically how I feel about that. Like, they haven't been reinstated. It's kind of difficult to discuss any of their candidacy for either of those jobs or any of the jobs that they've been put up for. So I, I guess it's just a situation we'll have to maneuver as it goes along. Well, I'll add this. I mean, my understanding is the league won't consider reinstatement until a team is trying to hire one of those people. So, I mean, the first thing that needs to ha happen is someone want, has to want to interview them and hire them. And then I think the league has to weigh whether or not to reinstate Quenville Bowman. At least that's, well, that's my, my impression or understanding of how that will work. Then my next question, and I understand you don't have that answer. My next question is what, 
would have to happen on for either of them for the league to even consider reinstating them because they are part of a very serious they will always be tied to a heinous and horrible story involving Chicago and Kyle Beach and I'm very curious to know what it would take for either of those gentlemen to be reinstated I'm not I'm not here advocating for it I'm just curious about it and I would love to know uh, if it ever happens for both of those men uh, what both of them did to deserve a second chance Right. I know they've both been very much in touch with the league and doing things behind the scenes, but I don't have full, honestly, I don't have full picture to that. And I don't know what the league's going to decide. So I don't want to, I don't want to presuppose an outcome there, but you know, I think that there has been a pretty extensive process in place to get to this point. And at this point, as far as we know, neither has been cleared and neither's in a position to get hired. So let's see how it shakes out. Exactly. And with that, that's going to do it for our Monday edition of the CJ Show. We'll be back on Thursday with a brand new episode. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, Leave us uh, ratings and reviews wherever you can leave ratings and reviews. And be sure to check out all the other great content at the SDPN. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long and enjoy your Monday and the rest of the week as well. The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.